Okay. Yeah. Evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the RSA. Fantastic to see you all here. Such a full house uh, in the great room. And also online, we've got literally hundreds and hundreds of people uh, online from all four corners of the planet. So welcome to everyone online uh, too. For those, I'm sure there's quite a few of you, who are RSA fellows, and for those of you that aren't, you will be by the end of the evening, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> um, you'll know our motto is about um, crafting uh, world-leading ideas uh, and turning them into world-changing impact. And nothing will better illustrate that motto than what you're about to hear uh, this evening, uh, I don't think. So we're delighted to welcome to the RSA uh, David Sloan Wilson and Dennis Snower uh, to discuss a new economic paradigm for the three Ps, the three Ps that are so close to the heart and soul of the RSA, people, place, and planet. David, uh, as you will all know, uh, is one of the world's leading and most distinguished uh, evolutionary theorists. Uh, Dennis is one of the world's leading and most distinguished uh, economists. It is a perfect marriage. <laughs> <laughs> a marriage made uh, in heaven. Uh, and that perhaps explains why tonight's event has generated such huge interest, not just in the UK, but globally. I think what's going on there is that there is a strongly shared sense that things aren't going all that well, right? Uh, we might need to rethink um, how society and the economy is organising itself, and indeed to turn that thinking into some purposive action that will lift the hopes and spirits and aspirations of people, that will help rebuild our communities, and ultimately will do so in a way that is regenerative of the planet as well. The stakes are uh, really that high. So I'm going to ask uh, David and Dennis in a second to introduce their ideas in conversation with me for the first bit, then for the second bit it's over to you, um, both in the room and online, so get your questions uh, ready uh, if you will. You can post them if you're online uh, in the YouTube chat or using uh, Twitter with a hashtag, hashtag RSA uh, economics. If you get those in, we'll try to get through as many of those as possible uh, in the second half. But for the moment, please join me. Welcome to the RSA, David and Dennis. <laughs> if we could start, um, David, with you. Um, Having invested many decades of my life learning the old model, what's wrong with the old model? Um, and tell me about the new model, the multi-level framework, and what that adds over and above that old model. Well, the old model <laughs> is um, uh, often said to be physics-based, and whereas the new model is biology-based. I think the old model is well known to be encapsulated, and there's a widely felt need to expand outward in what uh, Dennis and I would call the embedded economy. And that need is felt by everyone in this room, I suspect. But what we can add to it is the, is the fact that evolutionary theory, which began explaining biology and the environment, is now expanding inward to explain all of the human-related subjects. And so a theory that's already proven its explanatory scope for the rest of life, save for that one lone species, is now in every human-related discipline becoming explanatory enough in order to be applied. And that's why it's truly paradigmatically different uh, in, in, uh, in comparison with, a, with a, a school of thought. I mean, economics writ large is highly diverse, but the dominant position is uh, very much something which is based on a, a, um, a model that was wrong from the very beginning. And now, why has it been dominant for so long? In part because of the lack of a robust alternative. And I'll end my piece by saying that so many progressive accounts, so many people that are eager for change, they get the fact that it needs to be transdisciplinary, and we get long lists. We need to incorporate psychology, sociology, 
anthropology, all disciplines, let a thousand flowers bloom, and yet there's no unification to that framework. And so what we have here is something which will cause all those ideas to cohere. And that's what a paradigm is. So that's what I feel is on offer. Dennis. I think summarizing it um, in a sentence, a short sentence, it's variation, selection, replication. Variation is surprising stuff happens. This is not what economists normally consider probabilities, you roll a dice, but totally unexpected things. And then in response to that, something is selected as favored outcome to be carried forward and replicated. What is selected is not necessarily what the individual does, it could be what the group does. Decisions are made sometimes at the individual level and sometimes in our participation in many different types of groups. It can be your family, your sports club, professional, religious organizations. We're very flexible in that. But when we do economics, we assume that people have hardwired in them a set of preferences and the market mechanism gives voice to these preferences. In politics, we're hardwired with a set of political preferences and democracy is representative government is meant to represent that. That is not who we are. We do have individual preferences, but in addition, we participate in larger collective holds. We are social creatures. And not only do we participate in the success of our family, we can also participate in the success of our nation and country, and we can participate in the thriving natural world. And the low-hanging fruit in policy is to enable that participation to come to the fore where the big collective challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, financial instability lie. And if policy would grasp that with both hands, then I think we make a huge leap forward in our ability to deal with the challenges we face. This, I believe, is the equivalent of a new enlightenment. The old enlightenment uh, had a lot of emphasis on individuals, and that was important at the time, freeing individuals from a lot of in religious and other constraints. But now, recognizing the importance of groups and our sociality and our pro-sociality is absolutely critical. Fantastic. Well, maybe I come to you both and, and, and building on that uh, notion of a paradigm shift being needed, we could say a word or two about real-world examples, practical examples of how this new paradigm might shift the world, might shift society in a way that was sort of positive for people, place, and planet. In a way that, David, I could start with you again. Yeah, and I think that I can begin w with uh, what uh, we can call the fundamental problem of social life in both the animal world and in the human world, which is that everything that we call pro-social, everything done on behalf of others or one's group as a whole, is inherently vulnerable to more self-serving behaviors. And so there's a, a vulnerability to to pro-sociality at all scales, which you have to do something about in order to, uh, for pro-sociality to evolve in a Darwinian world. And so that means that groups need to have a certain governance structure, and the name Eleanor Ostrom is the single name that we want to invoke here. In many ways, what we're talking about is a generalization of that. And knowing that govern governing structure can help us improve uh, any group, any scale. And to pick, give a single example, the first time I, after working with her, um, the first time I used them was for a school. It was for a school for at-risk youth. Uh, we uh, designed the school according to these eight core design principles. We were good scientific boys and girls. We did a randomized control trial. We had a comparison group. And what we showed was by creating this social environment, we, the students came within it and like turtles who had been spending most of their time inside their shells, their shells, 
they quickly recognized that this was a safe and secure social environment, and they came out of their shells, and they did as well as, as the average student in the whole school system. And this can be repeated again and again and again. Final thought, we've done work on this comparing business groups with other kinds of groups. And what we've shown is, is that business groups need these principles, need the same kind of governance as any other kind of group. But on average, they're deficient in all eight of them. Every single one of them, there is an average a deficit. And so there's something about business groups that is handicapped. Why would that be? It's by the currently dominant paradigm. So there's a kind of a proof of how all groups, and especially business groups, uh, need these principles. Dennis. Something completely different. Um, I teamed up with um, Paul Toomey, who was previous um, uh, CEO of ICANN, the Internet Governance uh, uh, Institution, to think of how do we design a digital governance system that will enable people to have control over the data about themselves. And if that were possible, and it is possible because we've assembled a large working group of over 70 top experts in all aspects of digital governance, who are just doing this as a labor of love, <laughs> from the techies to the lawyers, uh, then people could form their social networks digitally as they do in the offline world. Um, this is the first time in history where our digital communities come prefabricated to us. These teenagers who harm themselves or have anxiety attacks because um, they don't have as many followers or as many likes as their friends, have they chosen to be in this competitive relation with others? No, they have not. Mm -hmm. But their networks have imposed it on them. If you allowed people to have control over their data, both individually and collectively, and this is where mm -hmm. um, all your thinking um, <coughs> really bears fruit, uh, there's a data commons where you contribute uh, a well-defined set of individuals contributes uh, for well-defined purposes to share their data and people have a fiduciary duty just to have the data uh, devoted to those purposes. If you achieve that, then you can move the next mile to what we've achieved in the welfare state. You can protect vulnerable digital citizens. You can give rights of association. You can um, have proper accounting and uh, frameworks that provide transparency, and so on and so forth. So uh, that is a completely different world. And just um, sort of one sentence. Uh, another aspect is we've measured solidarity, this community building, agency, a sense of empowerment, along with GDP and environmental sustainability. And we found for 160 countries, we've got time series, that solidarity and agency move in very different ways from GDP. The GDP can be rising, but solidarity and agency can be falling. And when that happens, then people get angry. Uh, and it doesn't help for politicians to, politicians to tell them you've never had it so good. They feel disempowered and they feel their community is fraying. And the result of that often is build a wall, give back control. And that, I think, uh, if we measured it, reported on it, and then acted on it, would make a very big difference, practically. And this is the SAGE framework that you developed? That's the sa SAGE stands for solidarity, agency, material gain, and environmental sustainability. And we figure that a country where people feel well embedded in their communities, they can guide their lives through their own efforts, the basic material needs are satisfied and they're not killing their environment, that country isn't doing so bad. Um, but interestingly enough, the countries that are doing very well in terms of goods and services are often not doing well at all in terms of solidarity, agency, and environment. And therefore, measuring these things and coming out with these figures 
of this with the same regularity as GDP, uh, and then embodying them in the reporting of government effectiveness, business reporting, so on, could make, I believe, a very big difference to our engagement with the world around us. So tell me, um, you make it sound <coughs> very attractive. <laughs> um, how do we get, though, from here to there? What's getting in the way? And how do we remove the things getting in the way to take us to this different paradigm? Well, I think that one thing that's getting in the way was how we think about things. And, and uh, an important part of the um, evolutionary paradigm that we haven't uh, um, emphasized yet is it's called dual inheritance theory. And what it means that in our species, that there's two streams of inheritance. There's the genetic stream found in all species. And there's the cultural stream of inheritance. And so our meaning systems, the way we look at things, everything inside our heads, try to think about them as like your genes and just as much influencing your behavior. And so what that means is that if we want to act differently, we really ha have to think differently. And just the exchange of ideas by itself can reorient common sense. So that's very, very important, just to understand these ideas by themselves and how they cohere. And then the next point I want to make is uh, also um, not quite accentuated yet, is that the, 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 the bottom level unit that we need to think about is not the individual person, but the small, functionally organized, and appropriately structured groups. Individuals never lived alone throughout our entire history as a species. We always lived in small cooperative groups. And these are the cells of multicellular society. And so something we can do quite easily before we get to the middle and upper levels of this multi-tier and multi-context environment, we can work with small groups of all sorts and we can cause them to function better as groups. And that'll produce two benefits. One is individuals will thrive for the reasons that you mentioned. They'll have agency, they'll have solidarity and so on at that scale and they'll be much more efficacious as groups than they can ever be as individuals. And so recreating the cellular fabric of multicellular society, and then of course we have to build up to the, to the meso levels, always with the welfare of the whole Earth system in mind. Dennis. I think what's keeping us is we have developed within an old paradigm that no longer suits our purposes. So the populism that arises um, everywhere, our blindness to problems that we should have seen a long time ago. Uh, take globalization or take um, automization, robotics. We saw that, as economists at least, as an unalloyed benefit because world product rises as a result of both. But through globalization and the flexible value chains, it is possible for businesses to take away employment from one community and give it to another on the spur of the moment, adjust the logistics chains, just because that happens to be more profitable. And then the community that no longer has that employment implodes. That is no longer the responsibility of that business and we are blind to it economically. So globalization has costs, both in terms of solidarity and agency, that we have not picked up. And the old system, um, policymakers, the academic advisors, um, the newspapers, the civil society discourse, is all focused on the goods and services and not on the other aspects of things that make us happy. And we need to get out of that old paradigm into a new paradigm. And to give just one example of how you could do this, and that is uh, something that we're doing in the Global Solutions Initiative that advises the G20, is to bring together, have a dialogue between business and policymakers focused on a simple question, which is what rules would policymakers have to prescribe so that businesses can compete and pursue profit without killing the environment and without undermining society? 
That would be a huge step forward for the responsible business leaders, of, and most business leaders are responsible, um, but have fiduciary duties that mm -hmm. force them in directions that um, they consider um, morally questionable. And it would be a huge benefit for policymakers who are stuck in this bad equilibrium of thinking, well, business is just trying to gain the system, so we will regulate the hell out of them. And businesses then respond by saying, policymakers are really inefficient. We better gain the system if we want to survive. So um, <coughs> I'd like to explore this dimension of the, the multi-level framework and how we choose. So if I understood the, the, the theory correctly, um, the right level in your multi-level framework depends. It depends what problem you're solving. So um, how do we decide what level is most appropriate for decision making? And how do we enforce that that happens at that level rather than at some level lower or higher than that? David. Right, so I often use the game of Monopoly to explain multi-level selection. The single game is a competition among the players of the single game. No scope for cooperation, really. Imagine playing a Monopoly tournament in which the trophy goes to the team that develops their real estate the fastest. Now teamwork is that, and, and it's a, a between team competition. But there's no context for cooperation at the between team level. For that, you'd have to have some kind of tournament of tournaments. And I said, what we're faced with, and this is really something very different than the concept of nudging, in which we think that we could just tweak human behavior in order to get things to work. What we have to do instead is that we have to basically evolve whole systems. We must have goals in mind that are systemic goals, and, then we, and that becomes the target of selection. Then we orient variation around the target of selection, and we replicate best, better practices. Now, ultimately, it's the whole Earth that's, that's the target of selection. But thanks to subsidiarity, basically, there's many, many cases in which the whole system that you're trying to, to, um, to evolve is, uh, is a smaller unit. And the externalities are either they don't exist or they're benign. So in practical terms, for example, a smart city is a good example. The smart city movement is an effort to make that particular unit smart. But if you're going to do it, then you really have to be selecting at the level of the, uh, of, the, um, of the whole system. And this is profoundly against the concept of the invisible hand, as most people. The idea that the pursuit of lower level interest benefits the higher level common good, profoundly untrue. And of course, that's the central me uh, metaphor of, uh, of the neoclassical paradigm. Mm. Dennis. We face challenges at many different levels. If it's climate change, then it's the whole Earth. And we need to cooperate at the level of the entire Earth. If we have water shortage, then it's a regional problem, and we need to cooperate at the regional level. Um, if it is care of the elderly, that's a really good question. Um, do we necessarily want the welfare state to take over entire care of the elderly? Or do we want f to involve families in it? We need to think about what the appropriate level of selection is. And once we have identified the appropriate level, that is the point at which we should mobilize resources and also public consciousness to operate at that level. And I think teaching this to children in school Fridays for Future is uh, a movement that is sort of already understands that without teaching, uh, that we need to look beyond national boundaries when it comes to climate change. If enough voters thought that, then that would induce politicians to operate at a higher level of selection. And if enough voters thought that care of the elderly, we need to reserve that to some of the next of kin, then governments would think, how do we reorganize our work-life balance to enable that to happen? And identifying the correct level of collective action is the first step, and then mobilizing our social resources to act at that level is the next step. 
Can I just add something mm. to that? I think a point I want to make is that uh, because cultural evolution does take place, we have uh, quite a few success stories that are out there, good things that have evolved by cultural evolution um, that we can recognize and we can, uh, and we can appreciate from this perspective. And I'll mention one, it's uh, originated in the Netherlands. It's a healthcare system called Burtzorg. Some of you probably know about it, I'll bet. You could have a quick show of hands, who already know about it? Okay, so what does it involve? It involves teams of nurses embedded in neighborhoods. And then these small teams get to know the people in the neighborhood and provide multiple services. And then it get, there's layers from on there, but I think you can see the multi-level nature of this. This turns out to be not only for reasons you can all appreciate, isn't it awesome that your healthcare provider would be having tea with you at regular intervals and live just down the, down the street? If you're a member of the teams, isn't it wonderful because it means that you're just not forced into some kind of specialized job. You're doing all sorts of different things and there's the kind of agency and, and diversity. Do you know it's 40% less expensive than a more centralized healthcare system? Do you know it's spreading worldwide? I think it's actually become the norm in the Netherlands and it's spreading worldwide to a degree. But of course, I mean, the progressive people in this room, about 2% knew about it. And so we can recognize wonderful, wonderful examples of cultural evolution having resulted in benign outcomes, but we can spread them much faster than they would on their own. So there's, a, a, I think, an important set of points to make. Really important. <coughs> and you mentioned the game of Monopoly, actually, which is quite a good example, I think, of, of just what you're describing. Because when it was first, that game was first invented... Was to teach the evils of capitalism. It was. Well, actually, <laughs> Elizabeth Major came up with two versions. One, the rules of monopoly, and one rules that involved sharing the spoils of playing the game. Uh, and funnily enough, they picked the first, uh, and the rest is history. If they pick the second, who knows how the world might have looked. <laughs> we have, by the way, we've, played, we've done uh, experiments with science clubs in which we have the kids play the, the regular game, and then we switch it in the middle. Oh, really? And then we have them Brilliant. play the team game, and you can just see this change in, in shift. And, and the joy that comes working as a team, actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's fun both ways, I think. One thing you can say about our species is, we're really good at cooperating, and we're really good at cheating. And so <laughs> you've really got to, and with, with, with big individual differences. And so you have to, that's why you have to structure environments. So that, to, so that cooperation wins the Darwinian contest. Because it is a Darwinian world. It's a Darwinian world for cultural evolution, no less than genetic evolution. And so if we want prosociality to evolve in all its forms, we must mindfully select for it. We must mindfully select for it. If we don't, then cultural evolution will still take place, and it will take us where we don't want to go. Last question from me, and then we'll open up the floor. So get your questions prepared. Um, a lot about growth at the moment. Um, there's no inconsistency, I don't think, between having growth in your framework. But it does need to be the right sort of growth. Growth that's equitable, growth that doesn't extract from the planet. You said a bit, a bit, a bit about how we achieve these multiple goals in your multi-level framework. Well, uh, first part, multiple metrics are required. Uh, not just a dashboard, but there's some sense in which we have to do for societies what we do for ourselves when we have medical exams and if something's not right, then actually we, we, have, to, we have to discover an experiment to find out what's going, uh, uh, going wrong. And that the, the idea that society is a kind of organism or should be is a big, um, a big part of this. And then, and then this, the other thing I would say is let's not use the word growth, let's use the word change. Because change, of course, is what we need, and that change has to be very rapid. We need to be doing new things rather than what we're, uh, what we're doing. That's a form of competition. So it's not as if competition is bad. It's the right kind of competition. We need to suppress it here so that it takes place there. And, and if we were to do that and there would be rapid change, then economically, of course, that would be growth. Uh, so I think it's interesting to compare the word growth with the word change, because everyone agrees that we need change. We might fight over whether we need growth, but all of us know that we need to, that we need to change. Dennis. You mention in one of your RSA publications that um, this is the first generation 
of British people and Americans who do not expect to lead a life that has a higher standard of living than their parents. And that gives rise to a sense of hopelessness, not just in the individuals who don't have this hope, but also in the parents who want to provide for the next generation. And therefore, to be aware of what makes us truly happy um, and fulfilled and lead a meaningful life is really important. And so if we measured growth or call it change or progress in a way that includes our social embeddedness and our sense of agency and uh, uh, as well as material standards of living and the state of the natural world, we would be in much better shape. And therefore, to give people hope um, by saying, <coughs> You may not be ter you know, much better off than you were before, but you're much better embedded in your community. You've got much more control over your lives and you're living in harmony with nature. That would resonate. And if we then had national accounts and business accounts and so forth that uh, simply provided evidence that this was happening, there would be a switch in our consciousness of what growth is all about. And I think if we reoriented ourselves in that way, then I think our dream of progress is one that we need not give up. Because as human beings, if we design the system in which we live and we continue to innovate, we may well hopefully continue to make progress for many, many decades to come, but the old paradigm has prevented that from happening. Fantastic. To the audience, let's take uh, <coughs> perhaps two or three questions in, in, in a block and then we'll go online. We'll start here. Uh, just wait for the mic. There we go. And then we'll. Thank you. I'm interested in what you were saying about policy selection and specifically in terms of priorities. You mentioned that we need to select the behaviours and the activities that we want, otherwise we will end up with the ones that we don't. Just a thought as to whether there should be a selection of things which are moving towards or may bring great benefits in one area but perhaps less so in others because I'm just wondering how we get these perfect policy ideas which tick all of the boxes without waiting for a very long time. Gee, uh, Dennis, why don't you begin? And I'd like to answer that question at a small scale, but maybe you could answer it at a, at a larger scale. Well, at a large scale, in the Global Solutions Initiative, when we advised the G20 and the G7, we're always looking at what policies on climate change imply for health and what that implies for energy and water security and so forth. And it just requires a mind shift. Um, health, climate change, at least if they're transmittable diseases like the pandemic, the, those are global problems. Um, energy security uh, is uh, one level down. And working out the implications across these different levels um, and simply understanding that there are different levels means that we don't naturally assume that the nation state has to be dominant everywhere. There is a superordinate responsibility that the nation state has to supranational institutions for supranational goals and to subnational institutions for subnational goals. So subsidiarity, the principle of subsidiarity, make the decision at the lowest possible level is one that needs to be taken much more seriously. In this country where we say we need to move from centralization to devolution, there is no differentiation as to where this devolution may be required and where the centralization is good. 
And our paradigm helps create a sensitivity to that. Yeah, so at a local scale, just imagine a, a group that you actually are involved in and that's important to you. And imagine what, I mean, these are the kinds of groups we work with at a small, at a small scale. And if you have a pro-social orientation, in the first place, of course, you want your group to, to function well and to be doing good things. But you also don't want to be causing harm outside your uh, group. That's part of your values. And the, and the way we work with groups is, is an examination of values. It's highly participatory. And basically, the group decides what its objectives are, what its pro-social objectives are, in which I think some of the sorting that you're talking about takes place in a co-created co fashion. And then they proceed to, to, um, uh, to implement them. And so a, a point to make is that this, this is inherently a participatory uh, a process. For this to go well, then equity and and, and appropriate diversity within the group is, is, uh, is kind of baked into the democratic processes, is baked in. And I find that so wonderful because often, often, you know, the standard economic model works against that, and then you have to try to build that in in some sense. But here it's much more at the center of, um, of uh, democratic governance. We'll go to the general just in front there, and then we'll go take a couple online. Thanks. This is a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, come from Occupy 10 years ago. A young economist, Andy Haldane, at the time, said Occupy London was right. And I um, don't know if it's turned out like that, but in terms of participatory democracy, which is what you're touching on, what is your view on the new models which are coming out, sortition chosen citizens' assemblies? You know, last year we did the world's first global one. So in terms of participation, and bringing people's views in at that scale, it's something that seems to tally with a lot of the great work that you're talking about. Well, that again enables me to say that there's uh, so many positive examples uh, out there that we can, that we can learn from. Uh, a, problem, a problem with them is that they're, they're kind of trapped within their own silos, and so they succeed to a degree, and they spread, but then they come against boundaries of various sorts beyond which they're unknown. And so you could find fabulous examples, and you could say, you know, hardly anyone knows about them. Um, and, it, and, you know, it took 70 years to get where they, where they uh, were. And another problem, as you know, with social movements of all kinds, including Occupy, is that they start out with a big burst of energy, and then they just ultimately they fall far short of their aspirations. And so this really calls for the need of a certain kind of governance and and structure. If you're really going to have a, a, um, an evolutionary process, it has to be a continuous process, not just in and out. And also, what you're doing is you're actually, in evolutionary terms, you're creating an inheritance system, a variation selection replication process. You have some goal, some target of selection. You're orienting variation around the target. For that, you have to compare. And then you have to identify the better practices. And then you have to replicate them, no easy task. Realizing it's going to be sensitive to context, there's a lot of structure that has to go into that. A lot of technology, and of course, digital technology is going to be absolutely essential. There'll be no global brain without, a, without uh, um, um, digital uh, technology. So it really is a kind of a massive engineering project. We have to think about social engineering as a benign thing for most people. Social engineering has insidious cons Why is that? It's because when people think of that term, they think of done to and not done with. But as soon as we talk about done with, then the idea of social engineering becomes, we can still make mistakes, but it will be as benign as it can get if we're trying to do something. And it will be very technologically complex. It'll, it'll require scientific know-how, technological know-how, and then this kind of participation. Great answer. Let's take a couple um, of grounds. A um, couple of questions online, maybe one for uh, David and one for Dennis. Uh, so the one I'll give to you, hand to you, David, is from Sandy Taylor. The question is, how do we change the selfish gene which appears to be in charge of the global financial system? Hold that thought. Um, <laughs> uh, and then for Dennis, how about this one from Barbara Williams? It says, do you agree that sustainability, or even regeneration, requires reducing the three key drivers to environmental damage, namely population, affluence, 
and technology. So David, I'm going to you first on the selfish journey. <coughs> well, this provides an opportunity for me to say, first of all, the expanding evolutionary science beyond the study of genetic evolution to include all things human didn't get started until the 1970s, 80s or so, and then a maturation was required. So if you go back to the beginning, for example, in evolutionary psychology, you had the idea that basically there's a universal human nature, it's massively modular, and culture is just a kind of a thin veneer over a, hum a universal human nature. Fast forward to the present, and we have authors such as Joseph Henrich and the concept of weird, Western-educated, industrial, rich, and democratic, and we realize that, that, that we've been mistaking human nature for a very peculiar culture, our culture, within which 99% of science and scholarship has taken place. And so humility is called for. There's much more cultural diversity out there that we need to understand and include. So that's the maturation there. With selfish gene theory, we go back then, and, and my field of evolution, along with the social sciences and economics, was going through an extremely reductionistic phase. And selfish gene theory was an example uh, of that. Fast forward to the present, and we find a much richer conception of evolution as being multi-level and, um, and also uh, more uh, systemic. And complex system science is something we haven't discussed here, but it is also another science that didn't get going until the last quarter of the 20th century. And look how much our, our thoughts have been transformed. So now we think of life as, in terms of whole systems, much more. And, the, and so the, basically the selfish gene concept is, belongs back then. We've left it. It's gone. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. So, uh, I got to say that in front of the world. <laughs> Okay, with regard to the question, does environmental sustainability require that we control population, reduce affluence, and control technology? Um, I think that is confusing ends and means. Uh, we clearly want to flourish. We want to lead meaningful, thriving lives. And we don't want to bias our answer as to what this may look like. Um, it's uh, like a patient coming to a doctor saying, this is what's wrong with me and I should be doing this. Um, we should just think, uh, how do we get out of this mess? And so, if we want environmental sustainability, then clearly we want to generate a type of affluence um, that is compatible with environmental sustainability, which will involve moving technology in directions that are compatible. And that means, in part, simply making the costs visible. For most of history, human beings have taken the environment as something free, and they can use it, and after they've used it, they've moved, or quite often they've moved on. In many cases, um, they've managed it successfully for many years, but others have moved on, but allowed the environment to regenerate. Now, we are so many on this planet that simply moving on is not an option because um, the environment will not regenerate, and therefore we have no option but to do what David has just said, which is, to design a system that uh, ensures that environmental sustainability will take place and ensures that our communities uh, continue to be vibrant and we are embedded within them, that ensures that we have agency within these communities and within ourselves. And technology should be driven by those ends. And so there is a role for business, there is a role for civil society, there's a role for government to be played here. And if we keep the big ends that we want to lead, fruitful, meaningful lives, um, then I think one thing we should be aware of, which is we must get out of the habit of plundering our planet for the sake of pleasures which we think 
will be everlasting, like getting a new Lamborghini, <laughs> but they turn out to be very transient. Uh, that is a travesty. And be aware of where our long-lasting well-being comes from. And it comes from living in accord with our values. And our values are often values that induce us to be considerate, respectful, and caring of others. They induce us to give us a sense of agency, and they make us live in harmony with the natural world. Live in a way that makes us an agent of the regeneration of the natural world rather than an extractor from it. And if we live in accordance with our values and if we measure and report our success in doing so, then I think we will have much happier and more uh, thriving populations uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Back in the room. Uh, let's go maybe one here. Uh, and then there were some hands over here to begin with, so I'm going to go over here as well to one of the three over here. Hello there. I'm Meryl Woodward from the Catholic Church. Um, I'm, I work for the Diocese of Westminster. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated with what you're saying because it's exactly the experiment that Pope Francis is leading at the moment it, across the global Catholic Church. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it. You are? Yeah. No. So he spent um, uh, all of his um, time in, in, in office um, creating a, and uh, developing the Catholic social teaching values and making those really clear to us, like the Laudato Si paper, which is on people and planet. And now he is um, developing the listening church, which involves uh, subsidiarity listening at very, in very small groups at every level. Um, anything that comes up from that is and it's listening rather than debating and um, things that come out of that it's, it's framed in a way that it's uh, you've got to think about the the values and it's there's a lot of discernment and reflection in that and then it goes up anything that can't be solved at local level goes up to the next level and that is happening on a global level it's currently at the continental stage and um, we're asked to think about it at each level. Absolutely amazing. This is exactly what, that what he's doing. Um, and it's great that we can all learn from it, maybe. Okay, one more question and come back oh to yeah, David and Dennis. M Mark Cliff, um, I, I can uh, make you a, a very concrete uh, policy proposal to shoot at. It seems to me, as Dennis was uh, talking about a moment ago, that we need to attack the cancer of materialism and therefore, why don't we use the tax system to do that? You were lumping together goods and services earlier on. I think that's entirely wrong. Goods are made of stuff which needs to be taxed. And so why not have a very progressive consumption tax on goods only? This is and use that to subsidize consumption of services, which of course are by definition labor intensive with particular redirection of resources to the poor as well. This is exactly what the economist, the American economist Robert Frank called for in a book titled The Darwin Economy. And like us, he's saying that the father of economics will eventually seem to be Darwin. And, and he calls for exactly what you're, what you're, what you're uh, 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 calling for, a, a, a severe tax on luxury items. And so now if you're a very wealthy person, you know, uh, instead of, you know, just, you can do this. And if everyone does it less, then the whole thing was based on ranking, wanting to be on top. And so, interesting you should mention it, uh, because that's exactly what uh, um, Frank calls for in his book, The Darwin uh, Economy. I'm eager to address yours, but Dennis, did you want to make more on, on this? Perhaps um, I don't quite share this view, <laughs> and therefore I thought, uh, um, we did not abolish slavery by taxing slave owners. We abolished it by considering it morally wrong and then implementing legislation that stopped it. And therefore, I think if we simply just taxed um, luxury items, it would still focus us too much on material well-being and simply understanding our well-being in a broader sense requires us to shift our attentional field somewhere else. Uh, and therefore, 
um, that shifting, I think, should be our first policy priority. That's great. That's, I, would, I would agree with that. I'm so happy that you raised all issues associated with religion and, and uh, spirituality, and there's so much to say about it. But I think one way that you can define spirituality in scientific terms, it's the psychology of being part of something larger than oneself. The psychology of being part of something larger than oneself. When you regard something as sacred, then you're automatically saying it's more important than me and I want to serve it. So the whole religious and spiritual imagination, I think, is based on functioning as a group. And Durkheim said that a long, long time ago. When you look at the great, religious, the great religions and you look at them historically, what you find is, is that they are indeed examples of cultural evolution that are providing a glue holding society together at a larger scale than ever before and the so-called axial age is now being understood from that perspective. But back then, always against the background of competition at a still larger scale. And so, and so between group selection had become larger, but still had that conflictual uh, element. But many elements of, of the Catholic Church in this case, such as subsidiarity, and the, the way that it was able to hold together such diversity under one structure is amazing social engineering, basically, that evolved. And I'd, I'd also mention, and now, of course, it's at the global scale. So you get people like the Our Common Home, you get the Dalai Lama in his book, Beyond Religion, and Ethics Towards the Whole, uh, Towards the Whole World. And I'd like to single out uh, the uh, Jesuit priest, Teilhard de Chardin, and his book, The Phenomenon of Man, who back in the 1930s actually very clearly conceived of a, a, a spiritual narrative for evolution, which is very current. And I have a recent article titled Reintroducing Teilhard de Chardin to Modern Evolutionary Science, which we can, which we can circulate. So Teilhard in particular, who was a heretic back then, I think really provides the seed of a, which he himself regarded as a metamorphosis of the Christian religion. If I could just say one word, yes. um, which is that most of our moral imperatives require that we participate in a larger whole, that we don't simply follow our selfish needs uh, and uh, embrace uh, care for a larger whole. And I'd just like to point out two precepts. Um, Love thy neighbor as thyself. If thy neighbor is interpreted as your social in-group, that provides for social cohesion at the group scale. Love the stranger, somebody whom you share nothing uh, in common with, that is uh, building bridges to other groups. And we need both. Um, and in this age of globalization, that needs to, the stranger needs to take planetary proportions. Mm -hmm. I'll ask a couple more questions online. We're <coughs> running a bit short of time. Um, and you can decide which of these you take, actually. Um, first one's from Ryan Bates. Uh, what advice would you give to those um, with education and training in the new economic paradigm that face a lack of jobs by operating this space? Otherwise? Uh, secondly, this one's even trickier, actually. Um, President Biden has been framing democracies and autocracies as being systemic competition with one another. Do you have thoughts on this framing from a multi-level perspective? So, um, would you take one each, and you can decide, you can select who does which one. <laughs> I take the first one, you get the second one. Good, off you go. Um, I think that uh, if you take the perspective of any person uh, who is, has become interested in this or thinks that, that they, they might be interested in this, they're going to start out with some existing state of their understanding. And the question is, where do they go from there, both in learning more and in putting it into action? And wouldn't it be nice if your day job could be, uh, uh, could be about this? And of course, that's a longer term prospect. Sometimes it can be. Uh, but even if it can't be, then you have your existing day job. That's work in groups. You could actually work to implement it uh, 
uh, there. And then you have everything else that you do with your time and all other aspects of your, of your life. And so what's the matter and what we're trying to do in our different ways and what I think needs to be done more is basically provide learning and engagement uh, opportunities. And then you can decide what to do with it according to your, your own pro-social your own pro-social value. So the trick is actually is how to catalyze in the first place just knowledge and understanding and in the second place how we move that onto action and provide mechanisms for that uh, worldwide. So that's I think the prospect and I'd love to think that the RSA could be a, an important part of it. Democracy versus autocracy. I think we need to introduce a deep sense of humility into this debate because democracy is not an end in itself. It is a means towards an end. And the end is agency and community. And many of our democracies, just representative democracies, rob us of agency. Now autocracies do it very explicitly um, but uh, our system of representative democracy is not that great either. You need a participatory democracy in order to make big headway. So if we are aware of what the ultimate problems are, then we can deal with this question with greater clarity. Take climate change. Will future generations forgive us for ignoring climate change because there is a war in the Ukraine? It's a really good question. I think the answer is no, they will not forgive us. So if we have conflict in one domain, that should not stop us from cooperating in another domain and uh, maintain our sense of moral compass um, throughout it all and maintain our sense of values that are associated with well-being within thriving societies. And if we do that, then we will improve our democracies and at the same time have a deeper understanding of why autocracies ultimately must fail. Last question. I started with the RSA motto world-leading ideas, you've given us world-leading ideas. The second part of the motto is world-changing impact. So how can we help? We in this room, we online, how can we make this happen? What is the call to arms? David Dennis, tell us. Well, we've been talking both before this meeting and in other meetings of the need to combine uh, bottom-up and enlightened top-down. So yep. bottom-up, grassroots movement that are taking place. Enlightened top-down is support, which is not done to, but done with, and embodies these principles. So I think what we want to do is we want to identify vibrant, bottom-up efforts of all kinds, and then we want to understand them and showcase them, and, and then we want to support them uh, in ways that are informed by basically what we've been uh, uh, talking about. And that can take place uh, in the in the UK and uh, globally, and because the uh, RSA is a, a global organization with 20,000 fellows, really? that means wherever this takes place, there's probably some RSA fellows in the vicinity that could get uh, could get involved, and it would provide a great opportunity for this international organization to actually get engaged in the place part of of your trio of words. I think the RSA is one of the most exciting organizations um, that I know because it combines the ideas with the practice. And if we can connect these dots, then we should be able to do something that is much more than uh, well-intentioned practitioners can ever manage or that the ideas people alone can conceive of, which is operate within a larger consciousness of where we are going. That is, we want to 
select at the right level, experiment so that we understand the world better that we are trying to design and bring in our networks. So the RSA is um, a giant network. Uh, here alone, pro-social world is a big network. The Global Solutions Initiative, big network um, extending uh, throughout the whole world. Um, we have Rory here, big network. Um, many of you, um, uh, I don't want to start embarrassing myself um, by leaving out people, but you, we all have big networks. Let's bring them to bear um, within this common framework. And that means let us build practical projects and become aware of where the obstacles lie. If government policy has become an obstacle, then let us combine our voices and make um, uh, that call to action with regard to government uh, uh, present and salient. Uh, if civil society believes that business and policy are basically ignoring their needs, let's listen in the way that um, you have said. Uh, and by combining our networks, I think we can achieve much more than we can achieve alone. So let's make use of these international networks within the framework of a new paradigm in order to achieve very concrete <coughs> things. And I think the simplest way is by means of one specific example, and with that I'll stop. Take leveling up the UK. Leveling up the UK is an intrinsically local effort. You can only level up locally, but it required a top down to make it happen. And what is the optimal combination of top down and bottom up to enable people to level up, not only in terms of their income, but in terms of their opportunities, and in terms of their embeddedness within society. That requires the micro, the meso, and the macro level. And think the RSA is in a really good position to bring these things together. And I'd love to engage with all of you who are interested online and offline to make that happen. Well, what a great way to finish. Uh, the RSA, uh, as most of <coughs> you will know, was forged, of course, in the Enlightenment. And tonight, Dennis and Dev has spoken about the new Enlightenment that we need uh, and how we can all operate in that multi-level way, uh, way to affect change. And what a fantastic call to arms that has been. All of the questions I've asked tonight were apparently generated by ChatGPT, I discovered. <laughs> um, <laughs> Miller told me just before I came on stage. Um, so in future RSA events, I will be replaced by a chatbot, um, <laughs> which will give us a better chance of finishing on time. I apologize, we've strayed uh, slightly over, but there's such fantastic questions. I'm sorry we didn't get uh, to more of them. Um, for everyone watching online, there are links available online to all sorts of things, including David's fantastic work on pro-social world, the SAGE framework that you've heard about this evening, of course, uh, design for Life and our own uh, work. Thank you all for coming along in the room, for all of the hundreds around the world uh, online. And last, but of course by no means least, uh, please join me in thanking the fantastic David and Dennis for this evening's feast. <laughs> <laughs>